everyone. I'm in class today. There is a big group of students in front of me. <laughs> and I'm going to teach them JNF. So I'm going to record this little presentation. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy it. I just gave you an introduction to the Bronte sisters. They had tremendous influence in English literature because they brought romanticism into the English novel. Before them, there was no romantic novel. And it was in the Bronte sisters, you saw the powers of nature, the vital heroines with gigantic passions. It was in these writers that you saw poetic language and uh, also, a lot of emo a mix of emotion, imagination, and intellect. They gave rise to the concept of a new heroine, the Bronte sisters. It was in 1847 that all three of them, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne, published three novels, one novel each, uh, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, and Agnes Grey. Was it Tenant of Wildfell Hall? That is also by Anne Bronte. <clears throat> Just before that, uh, Charlotte, Emily and Anne had published poems by Cara Ellis and Acton Bell. In their childhood, these sisters had written some stories and poems which are very imaginative, set in exotic lands. The most famous of which is the Gone Doll poems by Emily. So this kind of imagination, uh, which is wild and passionate. You can see in these novels also. Jane Eyre was originally published as Jane Eyre and Autobiography. It came as a pseudo-autobiography of the heroine. This was a common convention in those days to take the protagonist and present the novel as the autobiography of the protagonist, as if the protagonist is writing it him or herself. <coughs> In the Victorian period, usually there were three volumes in a novel. Jane Eyre also has three volumes. And uh, <clears throat> pseudo-autobiography and the three-volume format were common publishing formats of the Victorian period. The book, as I told you, was published under the name Carrer Bell because women were not supposed to write and publish in those days. As you know, this is the story of a very plain, simple girl. She is so simple that she does not wear any colors except gray and black. She does not want ornaments. She does not want enjoyment. She does not want a luxurious life, even though Rochester offers it to her later. She is simple, plain, genuine. And she falls in love with this not so ideal man, not so, not a chocolate hero at all, the rough and rather unlikable Rochester. In Jaina, she famously says if Rochester had been more likable and more handsome, she wouldn't have helped him when he fell off that horse, you know. So this is a novel with a lot of poetic intensity in character and its situation as well as language. It is a novel with proto-feminist elements. Here is a novelist or a protagonist who is a very bold woman. She takes bold decisions, very moral decisions. She does not do anything against her personality, against her character. And it is a Bildungswoman. It is a Bildungswoman. She grows with the novel. She grows with her experiences. There are five distinct stages in Jane Eyre's life. The first stage is when Jane is uh, with, living with her aunt. That is in Gateshead. The second is when she is in Lowood School. There she is a student and then a teacher. The third is when she uh, becomes a governess uh, at Thornfield Hall. She is the governess of Adele Varens, a French girl who is the ward of Rochester. The fourth stage is when 
she leaves Rochester and uh, becomes a school teacher with the help of St. John Rivers. And St. John Rivers uh, finally proposes marriage to her, not because he loves her, but out of a sense of duty. The fifth stage is when she comes back to Rochester. At this time, he is blinded and he has lost a limb and she marries him and they have a son. This is the, in a nutshell, the five stages in um, Jane's life. So, first let us talk about the first stage, childhood at Gateshead. Jane is a 10-year-old girl when the novel begins. She has just returned from a walk and she talks about her walk and her life in very bold ways even though she is a highly deprived girl. She is aware of the oppression that she has to suffer at the hands of her cousins and aunts. She doesn't feel guilty for what they accuse her of. She knows it is injustice. These are all very unusual for a 10 year old girl. And she um, even stands up against oppression in that first day that you see in her life. She comes and uh, she comes home after the walk and she sits and reads a book, Beckwith's Book of British Birds. She borrows it from her cousin, of course, without asking him. And he, she sits and reads it there in a windowsill where nobody can see her. At that time, John Reed, her cousin, who's older than her, 15 years he is, he comes uh, and uh, finds her, asks her why she took his book and snatches it away from her, threatens her, quarrels with her. Jane, this time, does not leave him alone. She pounces on him and beats him up and he lies there, the 15-year-old boy lies there crying while the 10-year-old girl beats him up. She gives it back to him. And the um, aunt and the housekeeper, what is the housekeeper's name? Bessie. She, they come running and she has to be punished for doing this evil thing to her elder brother, cousin. So the aunt asks her to be shut up in the red room in the house, which is where her uncle John Reed had died before. And John Reed had made a dying wish that Jane would be taken care of by his family. That is how Jane, Jane came to live there. In the red room, she has some hallucination and she feels scared. She bangs on the door. They would not let her out. And she faints and gets a fever. So, Dr. Lloyd, I think, is that his name? Comes to treat her. And when the aunt is not listening in, she tells Dr. Lloyd that she is undergoing ill treatment there. This is also a wonderful thing for her to do. She is not scared. She is not afraid of the consequences of telling the truth. And the doctor understands that it is better not to keep the child living here. So the doctor convinces the aunt that she should be sent away to Lowood School. Lowood School does not require any money. They don't have to spend money on her. They just need to send her. So aunt is happy. And the headmaster of Lowood School is a clergyman called Brocklehurst. He always wears black. And he comes to talk to the aunt and the aunt tells Brocklehurst, this Jane is a little deceitful girl. She lies, she cheats, don't trust her. And uh, <clears throat> after that, when Jane gets ready to go all by herself, she gets ready to go. Bessie bakes her a cake or some, something she makes for her. And uh, she has no clothes to take. Nothing much to take. And alone she goes in a carriage. To that long way to uh, Lowood School she makes by herself. But before that, she goes and tells her aunt that the, her aunt has been very cruel to her and she will go tell the world. That means the novel. She's writing the novel. It's her autobiography, right? She'll go tell the world how cruel she has been to Jane. This is a very bold statement she makes, a bold speech she gives. The aunt is shocked and until her death, as we know from the novel, the aunt couldn't forget it. 
it was such a shock, it was such a blow to this aunt, that speech she gave. You will think Jane will live with anger and revenge, thoughts of revenge and get back at her aunt and teach her a lesson and all that. This is how it looks like in that, in that scene. That is what you would feel when, probably, when you are in that situation. I'll never forget it. I'll teach her a lesson. I'll do this, do that. That is not at all what happens. After some years, Jane forgives her. She can't forget it, but she forgives her aunt. And when her aunt is dying and sends for her, she wants to see Jane. Jane goes. She doesn't have to go, but she goes, forgives her aunt. At that time also, the aunt hasn't forgiven her. The aunt has nothing to forgive. She is the oppressor. But she hasn't forgiven. He's dying. She remembers how deceitful Jane was, how bad Jane was. Jane forgives her. She stays there. And after her aunt passes, she helps her aunt's good-for-nothing daughters. They don't know anything. They don't know how to deal with the situation or keep house. Jane stays, does everything for a few days, only then returns to Rochester. Such a powerful woman, such strength of character. She's not cheap at all. Vital heroine. Never before in literature there was such a woman. Did you understand? So Jane reaches Lowood School. In Lowood School, she feels cold. She sees that all the other girls are wearing very thin clothes. They are not given much food. Very uh, thin gruel they are getting and one time a day they get some stale bread. Everybody is unhappy and ill. There is one superintendent of the school, Miss Temple, who is good and kind and she, Jane admires her. Later on, Miss Temple shows Jane a lot of kindness, invites Jane to her room and gives her tea and a bun or some, a cake or something which was a big thing for Jane because of her deprivation of food as well as love in her life. This was a huge thing for Jane. Another good person in Lowood School is a little, a slightly older girl, Helen Burns. She's a highly Christian girl. Brocklehurst and Jane becomes friends with her. Brocklehurst remembers that Jane is deceitful. And one day when he is doing the inspection, you should remember that he is getting a lot of money from the government for the upkeep of these children. But he's swindling all that money. He doesn't use it on the children. And one day he was doing the inspection and Jane accidentally broke her slate. And Brocklehurst realizes who this Jane is. He says, oh, you are that deceitful girl that uh, your aunt told me about. Shame on you that you made such an impression on your aunt. And he punishes her by making, making her stand on a stool. Jane has to stand like that. She, she might fall. She is feeling very much insulted. See, she has a sense of honor. That is also another important thing about her character. She will not do anything that will make her feel ashamed of herself. And she stands there and she's angry. She's insulted. And while she stands there, she has to stand there the whole day or something. Nobody is allowed to talk to her. <coughs> Helen Burns comes and tells her, forgive that man. It is okay. Suffer this. This is very Christian. When God gives you trials, you have to suffer it. So, uh, Helen Burns teaches, which is in some ways good, rather than fume and fret and raise your blood pressure all the time. It is better to forgive and relax and take things as they come. That is also there. Jane, Jane needed that counseling because Jane was the other extreme. But Helen Burns is too mild and meek and submissive. And compared to her, Jane is like an activist. She's like a feminist. She's like a rebel. And uh, Jane feels close, very intimate with Helen Burns. And Helen Burns is suffering from tuberculosis. Helen Burns very soon had to be put into convalescence, I mean, quarantine. That means away from the other children. And Jane misses her. Jane doesn't know what's up with her. So one night, 
Jane sneaks into Helen Burns' room where she is alone and lies down with Helen in her bed. With a lot of love, she sleeps that night with Helen in her arms. That night, Helen dies in her arms. She doesn't know. She wakes up the next morning and she's taken away by the teachers and other people. So that is how the friendship ended. And it's a very important thing in Jane's life. Meanwhile, in Lowood School, a lot of children die because of bad conditions. When typhus fever or yellow fever comes, a lot of children get affected by it. And then there is an inquiry into why so many children die. What, what, don't they have good facilities in the school? It is discovered that Brocklehurst is a fraud. It is discovered that the children are living in very bad conditions. And Brocklehurst's authority in the school is taken away. And somebody else becomes the authority. But Brocklehurst is like just an employee. Please keep an eye on your friend, okay? Your neighbor, the girl in yellow. Like a Thackeray book, she's sitting and... <laughs> <laughs> so, many girls die of falling asleep in class and... So no, sorry, I mean, of typhus fever. <laughs> Many girls die of typhus fever and Brocklehurst is taught a lesson. After this, one day, Miss Temple leaves because she gets married. Jane finishes her education. She is an artist. She sketches drawings, portraits of people very cleverly. A lot of Women in that time did that because it was part of their education. It was one of the womanly charms to be able to draw. Jane is also a very good artist. Throughout the novel, you can see her sketching. Then uh, Jane becomes a teacher at Lowood School. And after a few years as a teacher, she wants to leave Lowood School, especially because Miss Temple is not there. And she has applied to some jobs that she read about in the newspapers. There is one Alice Fairfax who has applied for a governess, who has called for a governess. She lives a little far away in Thornfield Hall. And no, did I say it right? Thornfield Hall. And Jane gets a reply from Alice Fairfax and she decides to take up that job. She just has two dresses, one grey and one black, a little pearl ornament, nothing else, a few books. And she packs this, bids good, goodbye to Lowood and goes to Alice Fairfax's house. She's under the impression that Alice Fairfax is the owner of the house. Alice shows her around the house. It's a big house. And she has never seen something so great before. And uh, there are other servants there. Alice in, in, uh, introduces Jane to them and to the little French girl, Adele Barons. Adele is a little smart girl. She comes and sings and dances for Jane. And the song and dance she produces before Jane is a little adult-like. It is not childish. And Jane is uh, thinking, who is this child? And she hears a lot about Rochester from Alice Fairfax and the servants. Rochester is, everybody is scared of him. He's a mysterious man. He goes away from this house for months on end and comes occasionally. And Adil Barons is a girl he brought from somewhere and she is his ward. Adil's mother is no more, Cecile Barons. Jane also goes to the upstairs room from where occasionally she hears a laughter. And uh, there in the upstairs room lives Grace Poole, a seamstress. She is uh, stitching curtains and everything for the house, household. And she's a little 
reclusive kind of woman living there alone and jane thinks what something is mysterious about it and inexplicable about it one day jane is feeling a little bored she doesn't have much to do after teaching adil she starts teaching adil and she wants to go for a walk and alice fairfax gives her a letter to post at that time they are also expecting rochester he'll come one of these days jane walks to the post office and she enjoys it and on her way back she sees a horse rider coming from a distance and then suddenly the horse tripped and fell and the man also fell near her she goes up to him and looks at him he is a plain looking man not at all handsome and she thinks oh this he this is not a handsome man it's okay for me to help him if she if he had been even slightly more handsome i wouldn't have dared to go up to him and she helps him up and he says can you bring my horse to me he can't walk properly and she doesn't know how to catch hold of horses and bring them etc so ultimately this man does it himself and he asks her where are you from she says i am from that house thornfield hall what do you do there he sa- she says i am a governess there and he goes away and she thinks about him on her way back home and goes to her room back home when she is called for mr rochester has come and he wants to see jane jane goes up to him and she is a little surprised to see that the horse rider is rochester and she talks to rochester pretty much on equal terms she is not scared of him like the others she is not pretending to be awestruck or uh, you know she is not acting survive she surprises rochester also because she is very intelligent and rochester has never seen a girl like this either people were servile and trying to please him or they were coquettish and trying to attract him women he's only used to those two kind of women kinds of women rochester likes her company and they talk and uh, she retorts and there is a an intellectualist exchange after this rochester calls her occasionally again and again to his room to talk and uh, jane enjoys it she likes it and she after a while she after few days she catches herself thinking i am enjoying his company too much i am looking forward to his calling me to his room i should not do that but she thinks it's okay he is not handsome <laughs> and also he is so much above me and what are you doing jane this is wrong this thought you are never never going to get rochester at that time everybody thinks rochester is in love and engaged to a aristocratic pretty girl called blanche ingram and rochester goes away after this he keeps going away and jane continues her life uh she sketches she thinks of rochester and then one day she hears that she uh, the coachman from uh gates said one day meets her he has now married bessie the coachman has married bessie and they miss her and she hears about john reed has grown up and he is very oafish he has eats too much and he is like already ill in his youth itself the two sisters are they are they are a decadent family slowly slowly drifting away to destruction and uh, mrs reed is also the same and gro- growing older ill rochester uh tries to give jane money and i uh, know then uh, the aunt is dying and she has to go and meet her aunt she asks rochester she has never she has not got her salary yet she doesn't have money she tells rochester she wants to go and rochester says are you coming back he is afraid that she may not and when he gives her money he does not give her all of it because she should come back he can't bear her going away and she says i will come back and she goes she refuses to take more money than necessary also 
back in the gated house she sees her two cousins they are one is very uh, i don't remember exactly what are the names uh, georgiana joseph no georgiana and me me el eliza and georgiana correct one of them is fully engrossed in herself the other is religious right something is there like that and she talks to her aunt mrs reed she is very ill and bedridden the not being taken care of very much jane takes care of her and she mrs reed only shows her she doesn't recognize jane very much and she remembers that little deceitful bad girl jane still unforgivingly how unchristian and uh, jane takes care of her and one night she dies mrs reed she helps the girls take care of the funeral and everything that came afterwards and finally they go away as governors or something they they go away that is when jane also goes back to rochester at that time rochester goes away and the word comes news comes that rochester is bringing home a lot of his friends to stay so there is a lot of scrubbing and cleaning and polishing the house gets ready everybody chips in for that grand party that rochester will give their party comes just before that jane has heard so much about blanche and gram and she tries sketching blanche and gram and herself she is very plain and ugly even and blanche gram she draws as the most beautiful girl she can imagine and then when blanche ingram comes all the party comes she sees them through the window she keeps away she doesn't go in front of their guests they are all very show offy kind of people loud and boastful and while they are all having a party downstairs jane is sent for jane thinks why should i go there but rochester wants jane to be there and be with them jane goes and sits there uncomfortably and she overhears the women talking about poor governesses and you know poor women she feels insulted but she stays there but after some time she politely leaves and rochester comes to her and asks her why did you leave he is very caring and jane tells herself no he is going to marry blanche don't start thinking too much she says to herself after a few days of partying one day while jane is also there with everyone somebody announces rochester is not there somebody announces that a fortune teller has come wow everybody wants to hear their fortune and uh, one by one everybody goes blanche ingram goes and she goes and talks to the fortune teller in a very boastful hypocritical manner jane also goes and the fortune teller interrogates her but jane is very straight forward simple she doesn't pretend she is what she is afterwards it turns out that the fortune teller is rochester <laughs> rochester had dressed up to play a trick on them jane feels a little angry again a strength of character jane feels a little angry that rochester tried to know her in this sly way anyway and she is convinced that rochester is going to marry blanche at this time before or after blanche goes i don't remember one night she is in the garden and rochester also comes up she talks very politely aloof she is she loves him it pains but she is rationally telling herself to control her emotions and don't fall in love rochester comes up to her and talks to her and jane is responding thinking uh he is going to marry blanche 
and then Rochester proposes to her. Jane catches her breath exactly like you did. <laughs> no, she doesn't. She does because she doesn't believe it. She says, don't make fun of me. He says, I'm not making fun of you. He's very genuine and professes to her his love and desire to marry her. She can't believe it. But then she con is convinced. And they go back, they, 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 they kiss. And they go back into the house where Alice Fairfax sees the two of them coming in and she realizes something is going on between them. Jane goes to her room. That night, the chestnut tree in the garden gets splintered into two by a lightning. The next day, Alice Fairfax warns Jane, these rich men will love you and, you know, offer marriage. She says indirectly, but you should be careful. They don't really mean it. You should be careful. At this time, Jane has often heard loud uh, laughter from upstairs and she has wondered what's up. At this time, all, already it has happened. One Mr. Mason has come from somewhere to meet Rochester. And uh, Jane didn't think too much about it. But suddenly Rochester called for Jane. And when Jane went running, she found Mr. Mason injured and bleeding from a bite. And Jane was asked to tend to Mr. Mason's wound and keep him company, but do not to ask him questions. And uh, Jane has got seriously curious about all these things and everybody tells her Grace Poole does it. She doesn't understand if Grace Poole is mad and she is doing all these things. Why do they keep Grace Poole there in the house still? And then after this one day, Jane woke up and uh, found smoke coming from Rochester's room. There also a candle outside. She went into the room and found Rochester's bed on fire. Their bed has lots of bed, bed sheets and uh, quilts and it is not easy to know when it is on fire. It doesn't reach you quickly. Rochester is still asleep and the bed is on fire. Jane saves him second time. And uh, Rochester says, oh, it's okay, it's only Jake Grace Poole. She doesn't understand. And uh, now that marriage is fixed, now Rochester and Jane's marriage is fixed. Rochester wants to buy her expensive clothes. Jane will not hear of it. It is not in her character to wear all these colorful, expensive dresses. She will not do that. She, he wants to buy her expensive jewelry. No, she won't do that. She wants, he wants her to buy at least a wedding veil, which she agrees to. So she has got a wedding veil. The preparations for marriage are quickly done. She has packed her few things. On it, she has written Mrs. Rochester because they are going away on honeymoon after the marriage. And uh, the day of the day before the marriage dawns. That day she is feeling uneasy. She can't get adjusted to the name Mrs. Rochester. Something is wrong. She doesn't know whether she wants to do this or not. Because it's she doesn't deserve it probably. Anyway, she goes to bed that night and wakes up suddenly to see some strange woman in her room tearing up her wedding veil. She is shocked and lies quietly. This woman comes close to Jane's face and uh, laughs and goes. Jane is terrified. But the next day, she can't clarify it with Rochester. She, she doesn't get the time to, for, to get Rochester to explain. Quickly, uh, in between, Rochester had already told her about his life after they fell in love. He was a very lonely man and he had a lot of friends, among them women like Cecile Varence, 
uh, when Cecile Barons died, he felt responsible and guilty for her daughter. It's probably not Rochester's daughter. Anyway, that is why she has, he has brought her home. It shows his, his good heart. And he wants to change. He wants to live a secure life. Uh, quickly she gets ready for the wedding and uh, she's taken to the church and it's all in a daze. At the church, suddenly this Mr. Mason comes with a lawyer. Mr. Mason and lawyer says that this marriage cannot take place because Rochester is already married. And Mr. Mason's sister is Bertha, his wife. She's in shock, Jane. She doesn't know what to think, whether to believe this. Rochester says, yes, I'll show you for yourself what, what is the truth. And takes all of them to her house, to his house, takes her upstairs, them upstairs, including her, opens the door, where you can see Bertha Rochester for the first time. She's crawling on all fours, like a mad woman. She is a mad woman. She's out of her mind completely. Everybody leaves and uh, Rochester tells Jane, this is my wife. This is hardly a wife. I had to marry her. Uh, but I could have easily given her up. I could have sent her to live in my other house for a deal. But that house is damp and it is unhealthy. I don't want it. I didn't want to live her to, for her to live there. I wanted to take care of her. That is why she is here. Forget it. I am not his, her husband really. Let us go away to France or to Europe. Let us live there. Nobody will know about all this. I'll take you away. Or, no, all this happens later. After seeing Bertha, she just goes and shuts herself up in her room and doesn't come out of her room for one or two days. She just, she doesn't cry or she just sits there in her room. <coughs> And uh, when she opens the door, she finds Rochester outside. He was waiting for her, worried about her. And then he gives her a little wine and talks to her like this. And at the end of the conversation, Jane just listens. And Jane decides, no, I can't do it. Rochester says, don't say no. Think about it. Give yourself time. I'll wait. And that night, Jane thinks about it and decides to leave the house. She doesn't take a lot of money or clothes or anything. She just takes a very little, one handkerchief, some bread, little bit of money I think, and goes. She walks and walks and walks. Her bread is exhausted. She tries to sell the handkerchief. Nobody buys it. <laughs> Silk handkerchiefs were very expensive. People stole them. I told you, Oliver Twist stole, I mean, in Oliver Twist, they stole silk handkerchief. <coughs> and uh, she's tired and hungry after days and uh, she finally comes to the house of Miss St. John Rivers. She hears three women talking inside, Mary, Diana, the sisters and their housekeeper. They are waiting for their brother to come and she knocks on the door and asks for shelter. But the housekeeper doesn't know the strange woman. She can't take her in. So she doesn't take her in. Closes the door on her. Jane can't go anywhere else. She's so tired and she collapses on the doorstep. And uh, St. John Rivers comes home, finds her there, takes her in, feeds her, puts her to bed. They take care of her, the sisters. In a couple of days, Jane becomes healthier, stronger and tells them, my name is Jane Elliot. She wants to hide her name so that they will not trace her back to Rochester and take her back there. They become friends uh, and Jane does not want to live there like charity. She wants a job. St. John Rivers has established a boys school already. Now he is going to establish a girls school. And offers to make Jane the school mistress there. She becomes the school mistress. She gets her own house. 
and she spends her time sketching. At that time, there is a little background story. Jane had an uncle, John Eyre. John Eyre. He had already, he was a lonely man without family. He had already written to Mrs. Reed asking Jane to be sent to him. If Jane would live with him and look after him, she would be his heir. Mrs. Reed did not want that. Mrs. Reed is on uh, mother's side and John Reed is on father's side of Jane. Mrs. Reed did not want that. So she wrote back to John Eyre, the, John Eyre, the uncle, that Jane has died in Lowood School. Now that John Eyre dies. John Eyre's money is given to his uh, nephews and aunts. No, to Jane Eyre. His money is bequeathed to Jane Eyre and nobody knows where is Jane Eyre. The lawyer, the same lawyer actually, writes to everybody he knows asking whether they know where Jane Eyre is. St. John Rivers also gets a letter because St. John Rivers unknowingly without their knowledge was a nephew of John Eyre. St. John Rivers was a nephew of John Eyre. Jane is another niece of John Eyre. They are cousins. But they didn't know each other. St. John Rivers gets a letter describing Jane, asking whether he knows Jane. And he gets a feeling that there is something between Jane Elliot and Jane Eyre. Is she Jane Eyre? So he goes to talk to Jane. At her home, he finds a drawing with the initials of Jane Eyre below it. He quietly tears the corner of the painting and keeps it and talks to Jane. Jane doesn't uh, own up that she is somebody else. And then it becomes clear that this is Jane Eyre and St. John Rivers tells us the, the story. Jane has got 4,000 pounds. Immediately, without a second thought, she decides to share it equally with St. John Rivers and, her, and his sisters, who are now working as governesses in different places. St. John Rivers says, no, I don't need it. She says, no, it is, I'm happily doing it. It is, we, you deserve it too. So that happens. At this time, the sisters who are governesses come home. Jane goes and like when Rochester came home, the house was prepared for him. Like that, she cleans and scrubs the house and gets it ready for the sisters, Mary and Dinah. When they are home, uh, everybody is home, St. John Rivers, everybody. At this time, there is a very pretty girl, the daughter of St. John Rivers' patron. That man gives him money for starting the school and everything. Her name is Rosamond. Rosamond Oliver. She is very pretty, upper class, and St. John Rivers loves her because she is pretty. But he is a clergyman and he is very different from Rosamond's and he doesn't dare to propose to her. But even Jane knows that he loves her. But then he decides that he cannot marry a woman like Rosamond. It is not befitting for a clergyman. And this man is going to India for missionary work. At that time he had asked Jane to study Hindustani language. Jane was in turn teaching Diana and Mary, German, I think. And uh, then Jay, uh, St. John Rivers proposes to Jane. He doesn't know how to propose. He clearly says, I don't love you because he loves the other girl. But I want to marry you because I feel obliged to give you a life and because he took money. I should give you a life and it's my duty and you can be a missionary's wife, all that. He tells St. John, uh, sorry, Jane. Had this been told to Charlotte Lucas in middle March, sorry, uh, Pride and Prejudice, she would have happily said yes. But St. John Rivers made a very wrong choice. You should never say this to Jane Eyre. 
because Jane is not a rational, practical woman who will marry for convenience. She is a passionate, vital heroine who will marry only for love. And also, reject marriage for love also. That kind of woman she is. This clumsy fumbling of a proposal, Jane gets. And Jane rejects him outright. I will come with you as a sister or something else. I will not come with you as a wife. He says, I cannot take you as a sister. As uh, I can only take you as a wife. This is a dilemma. That night she wor worries about this and thinks about She has no doubt she will never marry St. John. Then she thinks about Rochester. And suddenly she feels like she hears Rochester's voice calling out for her. At that time, Rochester had really called out for her. Later, when they compare notes, they understand. And Jane decides, I have to go meet him. She tells St. John Rivers that she's going and she leaves in a carriage. Another journey. So many journeys she has taken, which were decisive in her life. And she goes there, reaches uh, an inn, gets fresh there, gets some food there. And from there, she continues her journey on foot, I think and reaches Thrush Cross Ranch, sorry, Tornfield Hall. And she is shocked to know, to see that the whole house is black and burned half and looks like nobody is living there also. She walks back to the inn and inquires about Rochester and Thrush, Tornfield Hall. Wuthering Heights that is coming next is pushing its way in and wanting to come fast. That is why I keep saying Thrush Cross Ranch. So, no, don't worry. I know you are struggling also. Like, Wuthering Heights is struggling to come in. You are struggling to go out. I'll give you a break, don't worry. If I make it more interesting and uh, eccentric, etc., the story will not get told. And this is, there are so many things I have to tell you. That is why I, I, I'm just narrating. You have to bear with me and listen to me. Those who can narrate the story and teach it better than this can sleep, no problem. But you have to prove it. If you sleep, I, I, I want to hear you teach it. Okay, so um, she hears about Rochester's plight. Bartha has died. She set fire to the house and has died. And Rochester and his entourage are living in Ferndean, the other house now, which is clearly a bad house compared to Thrush Cross, Thornfield Hall. She goes to Ferndean. Rochester is sitting there outside under a tree. He's blind. He can't see because the uh, hot smoke has hit his eyes. And he's also lost a, an arm. She goes up to him. He, he hears the sound and asks who it is. And then, without a word, Jane just puts her hand into his palm. And she holds her hands and realizes it is Jane. And they talk and Rochester is worried whether Jane now hates him for this kind of appearance and this man that he is now. But Jane proposes to him. And one chapter begins, reader, I married him. It is a very famous line. He married me. I uh, succumbed to his marriage. That is not what she says. Reader, that reader is brilliant. That confidence with which she is addressing us and saying, reader, I married him. And then it all quickly gets over. They are very happy together. Uh, Rochester has had poetic justice meted out to him. And they get a child. And Rochester gets a little eyesight back. And he can see the child in a very hazy manner. And they are very happy as a family. This is the novel Jane Eyre. The greatness of the novel is certainly in its characterization of Jane like in a mainstream linear patriarchal novel like 
a man dominates, like Hamlet dominates in Hamlet. Like, you know, a ma male hero usually easily dominates in a narrative. Like that here, it is completely Jane Eyre who dominates the narrative. Her moral choices, her character, and the way she changes also from a very um, simple but powerful girl into a very confident, active agent of her life. She becomes, she has agency. You understand what I, what I mean? She is the master. She chooses. She decides. She does. That is so important. This is a novel that very importantly deals with the theme of passion versus reason. There is both in Jane. She has such powerful passion for Rochester. At the same time, such clear reason that does not cloud her mind. This is a novel that is a combination of romance, mystery and gothic. Rochester is a gothic hero. There is a mystery about him. There is an unmistakable gothic element in the novel. And these elements of romance and gothic serve to dramatize the internal struggles of Jane and Rochester. Then, another important feature of this novel is that related to the heroine, that individualism. Individualism as a very modern idea. Like Stephen Daedalus in Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man decides what he wants and does it. Despite all pressures and influences, he knows what he should do. He's clear about it. Like that, an individual, independent, thinking woman, strong and radical in her thoughts. As, like Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth Bennet, she is as sure of falling in love with Rochester and equally sure of leaving him and equally sure of coming back to him at the right time also. Nothing prevents her. And uh, there are a lot of novels that have been inspired by Jane Eyre. I've given a list here. Notable among these is the prequel to Jane Eyre, White Sargasso Sea by Jane Rice, where Bertha Mason's story is told and why she goes mad. Bertha appears as Antoinette Cosway, a Jamaican white girl living among the blacks. And her frustrations, her deprivation, etc., leading to her madness. That is the story of Wide Sargasso Sea. Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. The Waterfall by Margaret Drabble. Gorillas by V.S. Naipaul. Hotel du Lac by Anita Bruckner. Jasmine by Bharati Mukherjee. Lucy by Jamaica Kincaid. All these novels have elements of Jane Eyre. Very importantly, I should not forget to mention The Mad Woman in the Attic, which is a critical work written by Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar, where Bertha Mason is used as a motif in femin feminist writing. Uh, the woman writer is experiencing anxiety of influence, uh, no, anxiety of authorship. She feels this is a male world. This is a man's job I'm doing. In the beginning when women started to drive, I was the first woman who drove in my family. And uh, not my extended family. I mean, my mother didn't drive, my grandmother didn't drive, my close relatives didn't drive. I mean, women I mean. At that time, it was one big issue. I started driving when I was exactly 18 years old. And uh, it was one issue. My, my father would get into the car beside me. I have license and I drive. And he's like, ah, the road is inclining upwards. Put second gear. There is an auto coming. Put second gear. Turn down the gear. One day I told him, Achan, you will have to get down here if you again instruct which gear to put.
because the man feels an anxiety oh she is a woman she wouldn't know how to drive for example if in a family the man is not used to cooking some men cook a lot if a man is not used to cooking and gets into the kitchen the woman will have anxiety oh my god does he know will she will he do well she'll go after him and try to instruct him that also when i got married the first time we washed our i washed our clothes i didn't know what to do i just put all the shirts and trousers of my husband on the bed and pretended i am busy with other things <laughs> and my husband uh also didn't know how to make me do it so he stood uh, so stood beside the uh, bed listlessly saying how do you fold a shirt do you know how to fold a shirt and he did such a bad job of it that i said okay i'll do it for you move i did it months later from my mother in law i casually came to know that my husband was the man who was folding all the shirts in the house for years <laughs> liar he pretended he never folded a shirt before i suppose i have given these gentlemen some ideas very practical useful ideas for life <laughs> like that he pretended how that he couldn't boil water or you know milk or uh, cook etc he pretended but it was not pretend it was real <laughs> one day i told him i have put milk on the boil and i am going uh, to take my shower please switch it off when it boils Luckily, I didn't take my towel, so I came out, and he was there standing in front of the TV watching. <laughs> no, he had asked me how long will it take to boil. I said like three minutes, and he's standing in front of the TV watching TV. I said, "Do you didn't you uh, switch off the gas?" He said, "It is not yet three minutes." <laughs> so the woman writer, he didn't doesn't know how to cook. Let him start. I don't care. <laughs> either you learn to cook or you start he has lived in many countries till now in, including different places in india everywhere he finds one best friend he makes one best friend and very sweetly lives with that be best friend's family and gets food from them my husband is a survivor he went to canada and you know what he did i said every day he was not eating properly and saying food is expensive and all that i said at least one egg you eat every day and one day he said i boiled an egg and for for the past 5 hours i have been cleaning the microwave <laughs> i said what did you do he put the egg in the microwave to boil <laughs> No problem. Let him learn. I am patient. When he retires and comes, I suppose he'll start cooking food for me. But I have to be very careful. One day, my I was cooking rice and it got burned slightly. I very sheepishly served it to him anyway, thinking he'll not notice. He ate it and looked at me with a lot of love. He said, "Exactly the taste of the rice that I cooked in Canada." <laughs> one day i was busy cooking and i said uh, he was uh, hurrying and saying some come we have to do something I'll go somewhere or something i said i need some time i am making rice sambar all these things i i need some time wait he said why are you wasting time like this this is not how to make rice and sambar i said okay tell me how to make rice and sambar <laughs> what i did in canada that was the time only time when he didn't find a best friend okay <laughs> he put raw rice vegetables sambar powder everything into the pressure cooker and he saying rice and sambar tayar <laughs> one good thing that his mother taught him is even though she didn't teach him cooking if you don't know cooking at least this you learn from me he will eat anything <laughs> burnt or half cooked he doesn't even understand he eats <laughs> 
how wonderful either you marry girls either you marry a man who knows cooking or you marry a man who will eat anything <laughs> two ways to save your life <laughs> okay jokes apart why am what am i doing here i have to close this recording right oh yo all the people who will watch the video and see the hear the recording has come to know all the secrets of my life ha huh?